Welcome to CCG7's China and Globalization Forum. You're watching the forum's special dialogue, New Realities of China-US Relations in an Interwoven World, presented to you by the Center for China and Globalization. This dialogue is hosted by CCG President Dr. Wang Huiyao. Dr. Wang, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good morning and, uh, and good evening. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, so actually you are watching CCG special dialogue, New Realities of China-US Relations in an Interweaving World, live from CCG's headquarters. This is part of our seventh annual China and Globalization Forum. During the last two days, we had about four to 500 participants took part, including uh, ambassadors representative from almost 50 countries and uh, officials actually based in China, also uh, government officials from various departments in China, uh, and also heads of uh, Chinese and the international multi chambers uh, of commerce, representative from uh, international organizations, uh, and also uh, business community and the mainstreams, and of course, academics, uh, experts as well. So this is actually a uh, uh, a, a special program on, on webinar continuous of our uh, uh, Center for China Globalization Forum. And uh, we have covered many topics and uh, including uh, the global economy, trade and mobility, uh, China-US relation, China-EU economic cooperation, global cooperation, and the China's new development plan. Of course, also international uh, communication. Uh, now, we would like to have actually this special webinar, which we already had one series uh, beforehand. Uh, that is the dialogue between uh, Chinese and the US think tanks. We had uh, uh, guests from uh, uh, US, uh, John Thornton, uh, honorary chair of Bookings and the co-chair of Asia Society. We also have uh, uh, a former ambassador uh, of US to China, Steb Roy, and also we had uh, uh, the uh, president of the Peterson Institute, uh, Adam, Adam uh, Prozen as well. So, uh, but also we had a, a vice minister Zhu, former vice minister Zhu Guangyao took part in that uh, uh, think tank dialogue. But today we are having a, a quite uh, uh, exciting and also more uh, savvy dialogue uh, among our distinguished guests. Let me quickly uh, introduce our, our distinguished guests today. Uh, first is Ronnie Chen. Uh, he's the chair of Hanlun Group Limited, uh, also owns and, uh, uh, the, and also Hanlun Property Limited, and owns and manages world class commercial complex, and, uh, and also uh, uh, is uh, the uh, uh, public listed Hong Kong, actually, both companies. And uh, the, since 1992, uh, they actually expanded into China, developing only and managing world-class commercial complexities in key tier one and key, tier two cities. So it's a well savvy and knowledgeable expert on China business as well as uh, many other areas. Uh, not only that, I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Chen is active in many other nonprofit and education organizations. First of all, he's the co-chair of CCG as well. Uh, but Mr. Chen is also the chairman of executive committee of the Better Hong Kong Foundation. Uh, he founded and chaired the China Heritage Fund, is a co-founding director of the Forbidden City Cultural Heritage Conservation Foundation in Beijing, and also a uh, former vice president and former advisor to China Development Research Foundation in Beijing. And uh, he's the co-founder and the chairman of the Center for Asia Philanth Philanthropy and Society and founding chairman Emirates of the Asian Business Council. He also the former chairman of Hong Kong United States Business Council and the former chairman of the exec committee of the One Country, Two System Research Institute. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Chen is the chair of Emirates of the Asia Society and the chairman of its Hong Kong Center. And, uh, and a fellow of American Academy of Arts of Science and a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, the National Committee of the United States and China Relations and Committee 100. So, uh, so uh, uh, Ronnie also serves uh, has, uh, on the governing and advisory bodies of uh, several think tanks and universities, which include the Peterson Institute, 
for International Economics or Economic Forum, East West Center, Pacific Council of International Policy, Eisenhower Fellowships, and, and so on. So there's a list of all. He's also uh, actually uh, of the uh, uh, University of Southern California, which is, uh, he graduated there. Uh, so, so we're both uh, uh, you know, honorable to have uh, uh, Ronnie on today. Uh, so uh, I think because of a pandemic, I heard that Ronnie <laughs> could have been, been stationed in Hong Kong for the last uh, 15 months and couldn't come. Uh, normally, you, 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 you would join us uh, for annual forum in Beijing. Uh, now, I'd like to also uh, introduce uh, another uh, very distinguished uh, uh, speaker this morning as well for our webinar. Uh, Ms. Susan Sonten uh, is a retired senior US diplomat with almost 30 years of experience with the US State, State Department in the Euro Asia and the East Asia. So very uh, seasoned uh, diplomat. Uh, she's currently a senior fellow and, uh, and also research scholar at the Yale University Law School, Pao Chai China Center, director of the Forum on Asia Pacific Security at the National Committee of American Foreign Policy, and a non resident fellow at uh, Brookings Institution. So, Susan actually is very active. We, uh, uh, we come across at a few uh, uh, webinars, and uh, I'm very uh, honored to have you with us today. Until July 2018, actually, uh, Susan was the acting assistant secretary for the East Asia and the Public Affairs at the Department of State and the led East Asia policy making among crises of North Korea, escalating trade tensions with China and the fast changing international environment. In previous State Department role, she worked on US policy towards China, Korea and the former Soviet Union and served in a leadership position in the U.S. embassies in Central Asia, Russia, uh, the Caucasus, and China. Founder received her MBA in international relations from John Hopkins SAS and also her BA from Boston College of Economics and the Russian. So very well knowledgeable uh, on the international relations. So, so we will start our, uh, our dialogue uh, today. And uh, this is really a fascinating uh, time and also timely to, to invite both of you uh, to join our uh, uh, CCG annual forum, that uh, special uh, webinar online. And uh, so perhaps I, I, I'll start with uh, Ronnie. And I remember, uh, you know, you've been a, a frequent uh, visit to China, but, but, but I remember about almost two years ago, you gave a talk at the CCG and then you talked about uh, uh, the, uh, the future. You know, we, we were asking, maybe you can give some predictions of the future, what's going to <laughs> happen and facting. Uh, uh, the human uh, uh, humankind. I remember you said you know you, you gave a, a list of the uh, 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 things that. Uh, but one of the things you emphasized is the pandemic. I remember vividly you, you mentioned about almost, almost two or three years ago. We felt that was far away. We felt that it was something uh, not uh, real, uh, something that <laughs> not uh, happened. But but actually it happened. It's actually happened. So. So we're now in, the, in almost uh, uh, more than a year and a half now in this uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, pandemic uh, crisis and we're still not out of woods yet. Uh, so what do you think about the, the, the situation ongoing pandemic? Uh, and also that uh, you know, we are facing in a world, I mean, uh, worldwide basically, and how we can get out of that and what are things we, we should be more cautious. So we, we want to tap into uh, uh, wisdom again. I mean, uh, uh, Ronnie, please. I'll be great. I'd like to hear from Susan. Susan, great to have you. Great to see you again. Uh, Henry, uh, about 10 years ago, I drafted a list of eight issues that will all, uh, in my opinion, destroy a good part of mankind. And, uh, and uh, thanks to Helmut Schmidt, my good friend from my, the late Chancellor of Germany, uh, I showed him the list uh, and I said, I know every one of these will happen. I just don't know which one first. And he looked at the list and said, pandemic. I thought about it, I said, yeah, Helmut, you're right. I think it's pandemic. And that's why I, I told you <laughs> two years ago, whatever, uh, that uh, probably a pandemic will hit first. Uh, I think that um, the way, uh, okay, let's contrast two big countries around the world and how they dealt with pandemic. And it really tells a lot about the world today. Uh, one is, of course, the United States, the other is China. Uh, obviously, we happen to have uh, Trump there at the time, which, uh, sorry to say, Susan, you work for him. Um, uh, I a was little. a civil servant, though. I wasn't a political. <laughs> I know, I know. 
<laughs> well, anyway, uh, the way America handles is is very free spirited, and as a result, you know, you have uh, uh, 35 million people infected, and uh, uh, and 611,000 people died, uh, and and. I don't think the Americans can do it the Chinese way, nor the Chinese do it the American way. It just definitely tells you a lot about the history and the difference of uh, different cultures, not just countries. In the case of China, of course, what they did is truly amazing. I don't think any other country of any size, uh, except the very small ones, uh, can do that. And that is total lockdown of a city. Everybody was shocked when they first started it, uh, and eventually almost a whole country. And as a result, in two months' time, they got out of it. And up to today, uh, there's only less than 5,000 people dead, only about 104,000 infected. So it's very, very different. But on the other hand, uh, I accept that those as facts because the Chinese can never do it the American way. If they were to do it the American way, the government is going to be in trouble. The people is going to rise and give them hell. On the other hand, American cannot do it the Chinese way. And so what happened? Well, the economy suffered and, the, and, the, and, 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 the, uh, and a lot of deaths. But that said, I think the Americans uh, it, uh, is blessed with having natural resources like no other country put on a capita, per capita basis, as well as on an uh, absolute basis. And so America will pull through. I think America will do okay. Uh, and the people seems to accept the fact that, you know, you got 34 million people uh, infected uh, and 611,000 died. Uh, 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 but the economy uh, is really what where I worry a lot because I think that, uh, the debt level is getting so high. Uh, and I think America is a society that has run its course in having good governance. Uh, it, it's a systemic problem. It's not the people. Uh, when Susan is there, I think it's better. When Susan is not there, it's worse. But <laughs> hey, uh, it's not going to make... Sorry, Susan. Hell of a big problem. Uh, difference. So I think that, you know, uh, the pandemic tells us a lot about what's happening between the two countries. Yeah, I Thanks. guess. Mm-hmm. Yes, Susan, I mean, please. Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, I. So I, I want to take up the call from Ronnie on the on the issues of sort of how the U.S. and China responded. But first, I just want to note some general things that I think are need to be mentioned and are really surprising. I mean, first, so I was in China for SARS. I was in Chengdu in Sichuan province, um, and so a lot of the things that have happened were not as surprising to me, maybe as they might have been to other people who who weren't as close to that, but certainly people in China and in Asia who dealt with that in Hong Kong and other places um, in Asia that that had SARS cases, this was pretty, um, this was recognizable and it should have been more recognizable, I think in the US. But but the thing that's so um, disturbing to me is how much we still don't know how wily and clever this disease is And I have to say, I think it's going to go on, frankly, for a long time. And I saw, I thought, um, you know, there's nobody that's wiser on this stuff, in my view, than Zhong Nanshan. I think he is a national hero and a treasure and, and 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 a global hero, and we should all listen to him. And I saw today that he, uh, you know, said something like, we're going to have to get used to living harmoniously with this endemic disease. I mean, we're just going to, ha- it's going to be like a flu, or it's going to be like other diseases that are out there in the public domain. And we have to figure out how to have an annual shot and wear masks and take precautions. And some people are going to get sick. I mean, he didn't say all of that, but that was the implication. And so um, I think in the end, interestingly, you know, countries are going to end up dealing with this disease in the long run, all in the same way, which is, you know, it'll be this endemic disease. But in the short run was the pro- was the where things were sort of so different and depending on resources and politics and culture and systems reacted very differently. I remember I talked to one of our CDC experts that was stationed in Beijing. Um, in February, he was evacuated from Beijing in the first wave of people out uh, when all the families left um, after Wuhan was shut down. And I asked him about the shutdown of Wuhan, which had just happened maybe like a few days or a week before. And he seemed very skeptical that it would work and said, this will be the greatest sociological experiment that the world has ever seen. 
Um, and so that just goes to show you that even a guy who you know, knows China well and knows diseases in China well was quite skeptical of the ability to lock down a city of you know, 11 million people and have that, have that work. So um, you know, I guess it shows that Americans would have been disbelieving um, you know, pretty much across the board that we might think about doing that even. Uh, but to me, that signaled how serious the Chinese government was taking it at that point, because that could not be done lightly. I think, you know, the real sad thing about this disease in comparison with SARS is that it became a political football between the U.S. and China and thereby eliminated the possibility for cooperation and actually ruined all international cooperation on this pandemic recovery. And I would love to hear from Ronnie if he thinks there's a way to recover that because we're still in the throes of the pandemic, as you both mentioned, we still have a lot of work to do to get through it. We need vaccines badly and lots of them. And you know, if we don't work together, then it's just going to be prolonged and more agonizing to recover. And so I, you know, I've been waiting to see if something like this pandemic could could pull sort of the U.S. and China out of their hostility and sort of barbs back and forth and come up with something that we could do together or at least work in the same direction or at least stop fighting. And it hasn't happened yet. And there's nothing that's less political than a, than a public health issue. So this is um, a source of great agony for me, actually. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Susan. Also, Ronnie, I, I think absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, Susan, you mentioned a very uh, uh, very uh, creatively, and you've been, been both in China and U.S. for, for so long, your, your, your experience uh, in both countries uh, observing uh, firsthand. I really uh, uh, felt that uh, you're absolutely right. You know, both China and U.S. should work together. I mean, this is probably the, uh, the, the rare occasions that we should really work together, and China being the first to suffer, but now uh, the, all the countries actually suffer from that. I think the good news I heard from uh, CNN this morning is that uh, if somebody had a vaccine, 99.9% would, would, would not get by it or something, you know, so we will, we will be just uh, probably a, a big flu. But so, so, so vaccine, I mean, uh, China had already, uh, uh, you know, 1.5 million doses, maybe uh, 55% and US has 50%. So, you know, uh, you're right, we probably could, could call for a, a uh, climate uh, a vaccine summit, like uh, like uh, uh, or, or the pandemic fighting summit uh, between China and U.S. and uh, and also that uh, uh, like we had on the Earth Day summit, uh, uh, President Biden has called for that. So so it's really important. But I, I agree with you. You know, it seems like uh, both countries now uh, are, are politically uh, getting into kind of a uh, 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 you know shouting uh, match, and <laughs> which is really. No good, but particularly, you know, I mean, the, this uh, U.S. Uh, you know, recent recently has said, okay, we're going to trace the uh, uh, the origin of the virus because you know the the WHO already twice in China. Last time in China, they had 70 experts, including U.S. expert. They gone through everywhere, and then they they issued a statement. They had about 40 some days in China, and then they said, here, you know, it's unlikely uh, the the virus was uh, extremely unlikely. The virus was leaking from lab. So. But now they're going to come back again. But at that time, Democrats called it the conspiracy theory. But now, you know, it seems uh, they are following the Trump uh, uh, steps. So what do you think about that? I mean, that really is not a good sign. We should really have WHO, US, China, and all other countries, EU, Japan, Australia, to work on how we can have a vaccine uh, uh, you know, uh, for the developing countries and also maybe the, uh, the passport for the, <laughs> for the green... Uh, vaccine uh, travel documents, something like that. Maybe, so you know both sides, maybe you can give some more further comments. Susan, Susan first. <laughs> Thanks, Ronnie. <laughs> um, well, let me go back to the experience with SARS because I think it's very instructive that basically we still don't know exactly how SARS started. And even though, you know, there've been a lots of efforts to look into how the transmission began from bats in a cave in Yunnan and where, how it all happened, we still don't know exactly what happened with SARS. So my assessment is that it is going to be even more difficult to find um, patient number one 
uh, with respect to COVID-19 uh, because there were people that were asymptomatic that were carrying it around. And so probably patient number one was someone who was ill, but since the symptoms were so similar to flu in so many people, it might be very hard to find that person. Um, so I think, you know, since we're in the middle still of a raging pandemic, the real effort needs to be focused, as you said, Henry, on, you know, addressing the problem, which is people are still getting sick and dying, and we need to try to stop that from happening. We need to try to help go. in pandemic three, because there are more coming after this one. But so it would help us very much to know what happened. But I think it's not the most urgent thing to do right now. And, you know, unfortunately, it again has become this kind of political football between the US and China. I don't think either side is showing themselves to in a very good light on this topic. And I wish that, uh, as Michelle Obama used to say, you know, uh, when the other side goes low, we go high. I wish, uh, you know, people would find a way to move on uh, from this conversation. You know, maybe we can have some kind of a bilateral agreement or a WHO statement that says, you know, after the pandemic is controlled in all countries, there's going to be a thorough investigation and everybody has agreed to fully cooperate. And we will move that onto that track when we when we've gotten all of the vaccines out and dealt with the immediate problem before us. I mean, that would be to me the proper ordering of priorities, um, but you know, I'm not sure that anyone's gonna be listening to me on this. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I think that's absolutely correct. Maybe we, we should uh, deal with the crisis first and then, uh, and then and get the things uh, under control. And in the future, if there's a, uh, uh, further tracing, then we maybe should be uh, conduct that worldwide because there's many cases actually occurred also uh, at the same time or even before what happened in Wuhan. So you are absolutely right. Yes, Rami, please. Well, tracing the source is understandable. We always try to trace it. I mean, with uh, uh, AIDS, we, people are still tracing it, and that was what thirty some years ago, and then uh, SARS, and then now, you know. But as you well said, Susan, to make it a political issue is really, really uh, impeding. Uh, human progress, uh, and unfortunately, it happened at a time the this, uh, the COVID happened at a time when the United States uh, choose to fall into the to this track, and 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 you know, to, for example, to say that you know uh, China purposely uh, leaked uh, leaked this out, I said, who is that stupid son of a gun who want to leak it in your own backyard? You want to leak it, you leak it in somebody's house, not in your own house, uh, and this is I mean. I mean, brain dead almost. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but uh, why do you want to kill your own people? You kill somebody else. So, you know, when you overlay a political dimension to it, it's really, really terrible. You know, the, the, the source, who knows where it is? Some people say it's, it's in the United States or in the West somewhere, because in, uh, in 2019, it was already discovered in uh, Europe and in the United States with cases which were not widely uh, reported. So I think that this the political over, uh, overlay is really impeding uh, the whole situation. Uh, and, and once it becomes pol uh, politicized, uh, the Chinese say, hey, wait, 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 you are not interested in science, you're interested in the politics. And so, you know, we're going to block you from doing this and that, which is very sad. But I want to finally come back to a point that you make, uh, Susan, that I thought was very interesting. Uh, you said that your CDC friend from Beijing uh, evacuated, said that this is the biggest sociological experiment of mankind. Uh, it reminds me of what Sigmund Freud said one time. He said the United States is the biggest sociological experiment of mankind kind and it won't end well well he turned but he's a little bit personally uh, he didn't like the united states personally but he's wrong i mean the united states went on to become very very well uh at least until now and i fear that what sigmund freud said uh the experiment that has gone so well for you know 200 years uh is going to turn back and the reason is because i think america is picking on a fight that it shouldn't be picking and the reason is uh the 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 the, the whole rationale behind the uh, the fight that the United States is picking with China today yeah, is on a wrong assumption 
and then it's also a war that both sides can uh, cannot win. Uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, Iran and Iraq in 1980. Uh, is it 1980? Uh, it, eventually, both sides suffer. And I think that, you know, by choosing to fall into the Thucydides trap, I think America is starting a battle uh, that is going to last for a long time. Uh, and you're right, Susan, I, you know, COVID will go away. Uh, but I worry that in my lifetime, I may not see better days between U.S.-China relations, with her, which hurts me, because I think that many problems today uh, can only be solved when the two biggest economies in the world work together. When one party uh, intentionally make the other into an enemy, uh, you know, that is ridiculous. Uh, th that's terrible. You know, for example, they say, hey, China is de destabilizing the, the Taiwan uh, Strait and the South China Sea and all that stuff. Who has been flying in, in, in that area? Spy plane has been flying there from the United States. They remember the incidents in 2001. Right. And, and, and if America did not fly airplanes in, in, in the Taiwan Strait or the, have the battleships uh, go through the middle of it, would China react? China is just responding. And then now Japan, of course, everybody's brain dead. They choose to be brain dead. They're far smarter than I am. But if you choose to be brain dead, you are brain dead. And so, you know, and, you know, uh, China is de destabilizing the area. Well, stop the spying of, of, of planes along the China coast uh, and, and stop. Uh, st stirring trouble by, you know, uh, aircraft ca uh, carrier streaming down the middle of the Taiwan Strait or sending planes in other people's neighborhood. What if the Chinese were to send their battleship and their airplanes in California coast? What would the United States do? And it's really uh, insane what is happening today, worse than the pandemic. I hope China yeah. won't do that. My advice would be to not reciprocate in that way. But um, I think, think maybe Henry, think, Henry, do you, do you have another? If, if, if the Chinese were to fly planes on uh, on California coast and America would not reciprocate. No, no, I said, I hope the Chinese won't feel that they need to do that because that is exactly what happened during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Right. And I have been telling people um, for the last couple of years that China is not the Soviet Union. And so I hope that China will not feel the need to do that. Although I have colleagues in the Pentagon and in PACOM who say that China is more than welcome to do that. But I don't think um, just because they say China is welcome to do that, that in the event, it would necessarily be a good thing. So I hope China will not do that. But we should talk more about, about this particular dynamic. I don't know, Henry, if you want to interrupt with another question, because I think, I mean, I could yeah. respond to Ronnie's comment if you want. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just want to add uh, 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 that the, the, actually, you're right. I mean, Susan, you, you are the expert on, uh, on Soviet Union. Yeah. You're an expert who knows Russian, Chinese so well. Uh, absolutely, uh, China is, is not uh, not Soviet Union. Well, what I what I actually from both of your conversation just now, I I, I find that uh, uh, you know this pandemic fighting uh, maybe should uh, change a little bit of uh, uh, people's uh, uh, impression on China because you see actually China make this under control, and uh, China actually we just had a, 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 a event with the World Bank uh, jointly uh, just about a month ago that released the uh, global economic outlook. That China actually going to do fine on 8.5% uh, GDP growth this year. Last year is the only major economy has a positive growth. So, uh, Ronnie mentioned about his, uh, you know, close down. You, you, you said vividly, you know, that it was the biggest social <laughs> psychological experiment to the humankind. Which China well, first to do that? I mean, now we, we had lockdown, we had the, the massive tracing data, you know. Uh, follow and then uh, quarantine and all those. So now basically different degrees that's being applied everywhere in the world now. So that I think one of the things is that there's a culture, culture difference. China, you know, always respect uh, authority, to, you know, this seniority and the collectivism uh, that obey the, even sacrifice a little bit of the human right, but for the much larger freedom of the community. So that kind of total different set of philosophy, a, a, a cultural difference, made China what is today is more free actually economically, uh, and ac actually has the biggest uh, uh, trade the numbers actually <laughs> a, a, a new high on the record. So, so what, what do you think? I mean, you know, uh, but then China is not really uh, well understood uh, in, in many ways, and uh, and then that really not only because of this fighting, 
made us more closer, but it's actually drive us apart. So that's very sad. I mean, maybe Susan, you, you want to respond to that as well. So, so you know, we felt that this virus should maybe improve China image, but but it's on the contrary, actually get getting more worse. And now even US wants to trace the orange, you still want to demonize China or <laughs> or, or make China look bad. Yeah. I mean, what do you? Yeah. There, there were so many aspects to this that it was kind of like a perfect storm, right? And I think the politics had a lot to do with it. If we hadn't had a very negative US-China dynamic already started, we didn't have you know Trump in office and this kind of mutual recrimination. I mean, the real central issue, of course, was that Trump saw this pandemic as reversing his electoral fortunes that depended on a good US economy. And um, turns out, you know, if he would have reacted differently to the pandemic and taken it seriously and, you know, shown himself to be a leader in a crisis and done a good job, I'm not sure, but what he wouldn't have won, you know, the election in 2020. So it's, it's really for historians to look back and make sense of all of this, I suppose. But I think the, you know, the, the thing that we should not do is we should not view our performance uh, in a crisis that's a domestic public health and a global pu public health crisis. We shouldn't view our performance in terms of, are we gonna look good? Is it gonna be a good image in the world? Are we gonna increase our influence? Are we gonna win the competition with you know, country X? That's, that's not how we you know, work together on Ebola. I mean, there's always a little bit of this, like, oh, where did this disease start? That's kind of human nature, I think. And it's a very ugly trait of human nature, but it, it, we've seen it in other disease outbreaks as well. You know, we had the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. We had Zika virus. Um, these are all just within the last few years. So that's to tell you something about Ronnie's prediction about a pandemic being, <laughs> being in the offing. I mean, we've had a number of these serious disease outbreaks and we've worked very well on them together until now. And, um, you know, this is the most serious one, obviously. The transmission was, um, you know, very easily to, to, to be transmitted. So it, you know, wreaked havoc with international travel, international business, co economies it affected every single person in the world. And right now it is the biggest urgent priority for every single government and pretty much every single person on the entire planet. And we never really have issues that fit uh, into a category like that. And so it's just the perfect issue for all of the different governments to come together behind the WHO and try to you know, put joint efforts in to solve it. And we just, instead we're doing this vaccine diplomacy. Of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, people were caught without adequate supplies for protecting medical workers. That was the initial kind of competition that sort of drove things in a negative direction, I would say. But probably also the fact that China did this lockdown and people's impression on the outside was that this is gonna be draconian probably prevented other countries from doing lockdowns as quickly as they should have. So that's just, you know, it's just so unfortunate that there wasn't better collaboration and coordination. And the problem also was nobody had a good idea of what was going on in the early days. I mean, we just didn't have any information. So in a way, some of this is inevitable. But um, mm -hmm. I do think now, people deserve to have governments coming together and working together to try to beat this. Now we know more. We don't have perfect information and I don't think any country should rest on their laurels at this point. This thing's not over. Nobody should say we did well and you did badly. I mean, it's not over. We keep seeing reversals of fortune and I, I would just not make it about is my country doing well, you know, as compared to other countries. That's not what it should be. Governments should be figuring out how to make people safe and work with other governments to help them make their people safe. That's the only thing that matters. Absolutely, yeah, right. Yeah, I think we we need all the government to uh, to work together. I agree with you. So, so Ronnie, yeah, your your your, your turn, please. You know, Susan, I always find <laughs> very sensible and reasonable. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who are not like you and me, not sensible and not reasonable. And one of them is politics and politics everywhere uh, is like that, uh, especially, sorry to say, uh, the, the voting electoral type of democracy. 
uh, that kind of democracy has its own issues and problems, just like any other system. So, for example, I mean, Biden, Biden is not doing a better job in the U.S.-China relationship. And it's because the whole body politics in the United States is already moved beyond that point. So people asked me before Biden became president, uh, would it would, would relationship uh, uh, get better uh, if Biden were to win? And my uh, um, within me, I, I said to myself, uh, this gentleman or this lady doesn't know a hill of beans about what's really happening in the society in America. It's beyond party politics. Uh, and so that's why, you know, Susan, you're absolutely right. It's a perfect storm when you have a asymptomatic uh, uh, virus um, uh, at the same time when the United States uh, falls into a Thucydides trap. And so uh, I don't see, frankly, a better relationship uh, even in, in dealing with the pandemics. Uh, and, and I think that this is really a tra human tragedy of the 21st century. Uh, and it, if uh, the United States were to uh, back off in, uh, in, in, in this one area only, that is dealing with the pandemics and begin to co cooperate, I think it will be a lot better, but I, I'm not hopeful of it. That's why, frankly, uh, Henry, I really have a problem with your title, the, the, type, the, the title you start, it's the new realities of U.S.-China relations in an interwoven world. Well, new reality, that's for sure. But interwoven world, I think, you know, the globalization has already run its course in some ways. And already uh, And so the interwoven world uh, that the, the pandemic COVID caused us to rem remind of, uh, us of how interwoven we are. Uh, and yet right at this juncture that, you know, the, the world is being bifurcated. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the new reality is not interwoven world, and the interwoven world is not the new reality. Uh, so next time, please change the type of topic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, we're very, very in a broken world, probably. Well, uh, anyway, I, I think we have, we have quite a bit of discussion on that. I, I want to switch a bit of a, of a subject now. And uh, uh, so, so Susan, you, you worked in the State Department for, for so many years. You are, you are such an uh, uh, you know, experienced and, uh, and uh, seasoned diplomat on the sign of US relations. So now Biden administration is already in, the, in power for over six months now. And uh, now we had a, a, the sino US uh, senior diplomat meet uh, at uh, Alaska, which is sort of, uh, you know, surprised a lot of people. And now we recently, just about a week ago, we had the uh, uh, US uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Wendy Sherman visited uh, uh, China in Tianjin. Actually, she visited Tianjin, the closest. You know, we had other foreign minister came, but into the other different parts of the, it would be the further of Beijing, but the U.S. actually got the closest to the Beijing city to meet. Uh, uh, minister Wang Yi met, met her, and also Vice Minister Xi uh, Feng met him as well. So how do you interpret that in the last six months, uh, uh, you know, the new Biden administration compared with the Trump administration on the relation uh, on China, because you you worked at, uh, you know, you were acting uh, a deputy assistant of the state uh, at the Trump administration for, for until 2018. So until you know, things current... started to get really bad, that's when I left. So I can't be held responsible for the last <laughs> couple of years of the Trump administration. But yeah. Um, yeah. That's right. I was saying you, you know you know both sides. So so why why don't you give some uh, analysis? You know, which I think we, we haven't got a, a people that knows both sides mm -hmm. to talk about that, um, particularly on the state level, state of the secretary did the visit. So I think you know Ronnie's very pessimistic um, and um, you know is mentioning that the U.S. has chosen to fall into the Thucydides trap. Um, I I guess I hope it's not that. Um, I don't think it's that much of a plan and I don't think it's that purposeful. Um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty and chaos in the Biden administration as they sort of inherit a lot of things from the Trump administration that are still being sorted out, obviously. Um, you know, they're trying to focus a lot on domestic issues. Foreign policy is definitely second fiddle. Um, I think the Biden administration is looking to not have problems on the foreign policy front. But I mean, you know, I think it's fair to say that 
first of all, moving from the Trump administration's very sort of toxic, negative narrative on China to something more constructive is not going to happen overnight just because of the psychology of the body politic and the sort of the narratives in the media, et cetera. So looking, looking at that problem, you could see how, you know, it would take quite a bit of time and effort to try to fig- strategize and figure out how to change that, um, you know, without giving people whiplash. Uh, the other thing I think is that the, you know, Trump narrative on China is useful for galvanizing to some extent domestic uh, political backing for certain parts of Biden's program. And it's also a defensive move. And I just published a chapter in a, a book. The book is called Engaging China, The Last 50 Years of uh, Sino-US Relations. And it involved writers and authors who were there at the, there at the beginning, you know, at the beginning of US-China relations and then are writing now and reflecting back on the engagement. But the chapter that I wrote with Ken Lieberthal at Brookings is about uh, the transition between US political administrations and how US-China relations figures in that. And it's very typical in recent US administrations that presidents come in, especially if it's a change of party, and they you know, have been very hard on China generally during the political campaign, um, and they have all kinds of wild ideas about things they're going to do, this and that, with respect to U.S.-China relations. Um, we saw this under, actually, we saw this under Reagan, believe it or not. We also saw it with Bill Clinton. We saw it with George W. Bush. Um, maybe not quite so much with Obama. Um, but it is a fairly typical thing to see this kind of adjustment take place within the first year of a U.S. administration. And so, we, you know, Biden's been at this for six months. He's got a lot on his plate. He knows the U.S.-China relationship very well. And I have to think, especially after seeing his meeting um, with Putin and the way that he has spoken determinedly about having a meeting with President Xi, that he, uh, you know, sees himself as a leader in this relationship and wants to uh, drive it in a direction that's going to be better. It's going to take, I think, more time. Uh, the couple of meetings that we've had so far are not enough. Um, China is certainly venting anger at, you know, what's transpired over the last couple of years. And, it, you know, I just have to say, in fact, it's not quite fair because, um, China did not vent anger during the Trump administration in the way that it's doing now with Biden. And it's actually the Trump administration that started all of this and, you know, and did it in a very kind of, I don't know, sort of chaotic way. But China was, you know, so worried about Trump's chaos, it didn't dare say anything. So it's had all of this anger sort of built up over the last several years. And now that Biden comes in, who's a more reasonable person and a more, um, you know, level-headed leader, you know, they're sort of unloading on him because they know they can, because they know it's more, it's a more familiar and reliable kind of relationship maybe. Um, So, you know, we have to see that for what it is as well. I think it would be good if China could sort of just, you know, keep it low key for a little bit longer and give some more time. And then I I hope there will be a meeting of the two leaders. I know, you know, with COVID, everything, you know, we have to recognize too that COVID is playing a big part in this, in our poor communication, because it's very hard to meet. It was very hard to set up this meeting in Tianjin. It was very hard to set up the meeting in Anchorage. And it's very hard to get our two presidents together face to face in person in the same room right now. So I think we need to take a deep breath and maybe be a little bit more patient. I know China is uh, not fully understanding all of the you know statements and, and things that the US is making. And I, I mean, I think that it's right for China to question that in private and maybe even in public, but to do it in a way that um, leaves open some space for us to sort of move this in a 
in a kind of a more low key, gradual off ramp direction. Susan, I have a little bit, uh, slight, a slightly different take than what you've just said. Good. Um, I don't think, uh, see, your chapter with Ken, by the way, say hello to Ken. Your chapter with Ken, you know, talks about the different administrations. But for the Chinese perspective, it's the United States of America. Whether it's this president, that president, is the United States of America. And America has been so strong that everybody has to play along with the American politics and hence new administration, you react differently. But then from the, the Chinese perspective, as I see it, uh, is that they were really bending backwards during the Trump times. It's not just because Trump was a crazy guy in, in US-China relations and many other things. They were, China was really bending backwards, trying to build relationships, restore the relationship. And then they failed because Trump didn't want any part of it. And then they were hoping that Biden would be a little bit better and Biden turned out to be no better. And as I said, you know, some of us never believe that, you know, Biden will turn better because the whole body politics in America has already been poisoned. But nonetheless, the Chinese thought that let's hope, hope that Biden will turn better. Biden didn't. And as a result, the Chinese say, ah, this is very consistent, iris uh, irrespective. It doesn't matter what Susan and Ken Liebethal have written about, uh, about changing of administration. This administration is still going to go in the wrong direction as far as China is concerned. And hence, they are becoming tougher and tougher. And I agree with you, Susan. I hope that, uh, that sorry, there are two, two people fighting on the stage right now. In the past, there was one adult that was China, not Trump, not the United States. But now I'm afraid that there's no adult uh, uh, on the stage anymore. And that's where I begin to worry. But let me also take another uh, uh, backward look. Uh, I think that what is changing today is a culmination of 30 years of relationship. In other words, by 1990, when the Soviet Union fell, uh, uh, China had uh, June 4th of the year before, uh, 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 and, and, and the United States began to see China in a very, very different light. As I told Henry Kissinger, I said, what you did in 1972, uh, in some ways is very good, but the reason behind it is basically the presence of Soviet Union. And it's uh, not strong enough, not good enough, a reason for it to last if Soviet Union is no longer a problem. Most of us didn't see Soviet Union collapsing. And it, when it collapsed in the early 1990s, uh, uh, the rationale for having better relationship uh, dissipated. And so many of uh, my friends, you know, Paul Wolfowitz, for example, begin to write white paper and this and that in 1992. Uh, about you know the Pacific, about, it's really targeting China. So that relationship has been on the wane for 30 years. Uh, and so we are really not uh, just looking at Trump and Biden. We should look at the last 30 years where relationship are on the downswing. It wasn't, you know, when, when, when uh, the Korean War came, uh, the relationship dropped off the cliff. When Nixon went to China, the relationship out of the overnight went to heaven. But this time, from 1990 onward, roughly, the relationship has been gradually trending down. And so what Trump did is just to kick it into hell, that's all. And then the whole body politics in America has been so poisoned vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. You know, they say China is a threat. China is a threat to who? China is a threat not to the world. China is a threat to American supremacy, perhaps, in some areas. And so, you know, and then 90, as in any society, 95% of the uh, of the population don't really uh, understand these things or analyze these things. So if the if if the president says that, hey, you know, uh, China is a bad guy, China is a bad guy. How many people really know enough to think through issues? And so you know, we are. It's a very sad situation. I never thought that I will see the day when the U.S.-China relationship get to that bad a situation, and I don't foresee it getting better anytime soon, whether it is the Democrats or the Republicans. Well, you yeah. mentioned the last 30 years, Ronnie. I mean, that exactly coincides with my time in the State Department, basically. I, I joined in 1991, the year that Soviet Union collapsed, and it went to the Soviet Union. But I agree with your fundamental uh, observation that we really never had a uh, in the U.S., we would say, I don't know how the interpreter is going to translate this, but a come to Jesus moment after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
Um, with China, it was because we were still recovering from the June 4th. But um, I think we never had that moment inside the United States either to figure out sort of what it was now after the collapse of the Soviet Union that the US was going to be doing in the world. I mean, you say the attitude was about US supremacy, but I don't think that the inside the United States, there was this, there was no debate really. Uh, there was Frank Fukuyama's uh, book about the end of history. And sort of, it just, everyone just kind of assumed that like everything would fall into place now and just go on. And they, you know, were preoccupied with Europe, of course, and um, lots of other things, the Balkans. Um, then we moved into the great war on terror. And so it's just like never really sitting down and saying, okay, what is the purpose of our, of our, place in the world now and really it coincided also with this rapid globalization. I mean, Henry, your center is about globalization and Ronnie doesn't think that we should uh, have the title globalization or interwoven world in the, in the top, but I want to come back to it because really the 90s was the, was the decade of globalization and um, we probably hit peak globalization around 2008 before the financial crisis, but but we never updated the institutions. We never actually sat around and fundamentally kind of thought about how globalization changes the international discourse and the way countries are gonna to operate together. We never really did that. And now we're kind of grown up with this international system. You know, China says UN charter, but the UN charter is not enough just I mean, to, to serve us in a globalized world, it's not enough. We have to have rules and institutions around all these other things that are trans-border phenomena and transnational phenomena and our systems don't fit together. So how are we gonna do that? We've never really had that um, conversation in my view. And so now China says, well, the US made all those rules, we don't want them. And the US says, well, China's trying to dump all the rules and impose its system on everyone. And, and so that's not a productive way of looking at the situation, actually, when you can see, yeah. looking back, how we got to here. Yeah, I'm totally with you, Susan, on that one. I think, you know, uh, on the side of, sorry, that you and I have probably can't uh, in the camp off, and that is, you know, wanting the world to be a more peaceful one and, 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 and U.S.-China relationship develop in a better way. We really did not come up with a, uh, whatever moment you call it, um, it, we did not really have an intellectual discussion uh, that is nationwide in the United States, uh, why we are doing what, why we and now what's next? there's really not an intellectual discussion along that line. And then at the same time, you have people such as Donald Rumsfeld, such as Paul Wolfowitz, such as uh, uh, the vice president under um, whatever. Cheney, anyway, yeah. uh, Cheney, you know, they begin to, the neocons begin to uh, you know, move uh, briskly uh, during that time. And I think that the globalization of the world uh, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union uh, blunted their uh, advance somewhat, but then eventually uh, they took you know, the center stage. Uh, and today, you know, whether it's Trump and even Biden, you know, 20, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I would never imagine Biden taking the position that it does today vis a vis China. And so you can, that, that tells you how that the whole political uh, apparatus in America. Uh, and then with the media really into, uh, influencing the, the, the society has moved in the wrong direction. And it's an aircraft carrier. You, 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 uh, aircraft carrier cannot turn easily. Uh, and, and, and that's what I'm afraid that we are looking at. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think uh, both of you have actually give a very good uh, uh, you know, uh, analysis of the, of the situation. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, this year actually uh, marked uh, uh, 50 years of uh, Kiss Dr. Kissinger's secret visit to China. We just had the, uh, 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 you know, webinar with him just about uh, 20 days ago that uh, uh, celebrated uh, his historical visit. And also it's the 20 years of China joined WTO and, uh, uh, you know, 30 years of uh, ending the Cold War. Uh, that's where uh, Susan started uh, 
uh, your diplomatic uh, at the State Department, diplomatic career, uh, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, glorious. What, what, what I would like to uh, uh, say actually further, uh, maybe, maybe put a little detail because uh, we had the uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, uh, Ms. Sherman's visit to Tianjin. And then in that meeting, I think it's better than Alaska, probably both sides are now come up with some uh, concrete list now, you know, at least to say we, we have to, you know, work down and see how we can resolve, resolve those differences. And of course, also that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Chinese, as I proposed, there's some uh, uh, ideas how we can really shut down, you know, maybe some, some list of, of the controversy or, or things that the China don't want. But uh, on the other hand, also, uh, the uh, the U.S. has proposed at least two. Uh, so, but the, ultimately, we hope that maybe, uh, as Susan you said, you know, maybe it's it's this COVID nineteen is not really helping. We need more uh, frequency of the highest senior diplomatic visit, but also uh, probably even top heads of the state visit uh, a meeting at the G twenty if possible. But right after the meeting of Tianjin, uh, Foreign Minister Qin Gang actually went to the United States and already arrived in Washington. Uh, I, uh, so we hope that we can start a new, uh, some concrete uh, discussion on that. I noticed actually, uh, you know, yesterday, uh, Steve Orleans, the, 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 from National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, he wrote a piece at the South China Morning Post in the, he, titled, How the U.S. Can Craft a Bold and Positive China Agenda That Benefits All Americans. Basically, he's uh, up at, he said, uh, let's, let's revoke uh, tariffs, Let's revisit the curbs on the Chinese people, Chinese companies, and the media. Engage constructively on human rights and international norms. Fine tune Taiwan policy and ditch confrontation. The US should not understate the benefit of constructive engagement brought to the American people. So it seems a very good, uh, very good uh, uh, op-ed, and uh, he, he made a lot of recommendations, you, you know, relax the visas, relax student visit, you know, and then maybe we, we, we should not confrontation so much. So, so Susan, what do you think? Maybe we, we follow a bit more concrete and things like we can re, uh, re, revoke, you know, like tariff and uh, things like that. So maybe we, uh, you know, you could give some more insights on that. <laughs> Susan, please. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I am hopeful that, I mean, I wasn't so happy that the, uh, frankly, that the, the notion of giving the U.S. a list of demands was publicized, because I think that makes it then, you know, politically harder in the U.S. to do those things, not easier. It's good to keep, in U.S.-China relations, it's good to keep some of those detailed issues um, for the closed door meeting. But so I hope that won't, um, you know, just sit, it won't entrench the two sides demanding that the other side make the first move. I'm afraid that might be where we are now. And I, I, wor I do worry about that. We need somebody to do something that's a little bit, um, you know, bold and shows leadership to try to get this thing on unstuck. But I'm hopeful that these kind of, you know, lists of issues and certainly Wendy Sherman's uh, meeting that both sides mentioned these areas for potential cooperation. Um, climate change has, of course, been one that has been mentioned frequently. It's gonna be very hard, but I'm gonna keep pushing it because it's inexcusable and will be a historical shame if we don't do it. Um, and you know, there are other issues, Afghanistan, North Korea, uh, Myanmar, I think, uh, were mentioned. So there are a number of areas where we can, um, you know, find ways, hopefully, to cooperate. We're doing, uh, you know, joint negotiations still, I hope, with Iran, and I hope that that it becomes more fruitful in the future than, it, than it's indicating right now. But we, we, you know, we have to do these things together and I hope we can sort of work toward something pragmatic like that after these meetings. Um, but the, you know, the, there's still this, there's a lot of politics swirling around in Washington as, as Ronnie has, you know, pointed out. And frankly, there's a lot of things happening also in Beijing and, you know, the <coughs> domestic politics are really creating a lot of problems for both sides right now. And I think, 
Um, we do need to see some bold leadership in both capitals to try to get through this impasse. Uh, maybe a little bit less worrying about, you know, protecting your flank from this or that. I don't know how realistic that is. Maybe Ronnie has a, a view on that for how realistic it is in Beijing. Um, you know, it is difficult in Washington right now, too. Biden's trying to get big spending bills through, and it's, it's a difficult political environment for him. But, you know, I do think he wants to uh, get the relationship with China in a better place. Um, and so I, you know, just knowing him and knowing his experience with China, even though he sounds tough and he is tough, I think he's worried, frankly, the biggest worry and Rhonda, you talked about, you know, who's threatening who and who's doing what to whom. And I mean, I think um, in the region, China's military buildup is causing concern and that causes demand signals for U.S involvement and the U.S. is feeling after Trump um, a kind of over-exaggerated need to reassure people in the region that the U.S. is going to be there and, you know, in the face of their insecurity coming from China's military buildup. But the real problem is um, the economy. The Americans and Joe Biden also feels this, that you know, it's really not clear the shape, the future shape of the international economy and the place of the U.S. and China in it is very, is very cloudy right now, I think. And uh, international businesses are feeling this. Um, I think developed countries in general who rely on sort of innovation and technology to be their engines of growth are feeling this. And it's causing a lot of anxiety. And I think that the, the really the sort of feeling that there's an economic threat coming from China and we can't, we can't make China understand why we feel this way is, is a real problem. So um, maybe I'll just stop there and see if you all have a reaction to that. Well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so uh, you know, Ronnie, yes, yeah, please. Uh, many years ago, I, I, I have a dear friend, a couple, <clears throat> and one party later I found out already wanted to divorce and she didn't let it out. Let, didn't let people know, but once in a great while, I got an inkling that, man, maybe she doesn't want this relationship to continue. And so they, she, she played along and they were together. They go out to dinner. They take care of the family, I mean, the children or whatever. But in her heart, she was divorced already. And that's what I'm afraid is happening today, that the United States has, the body politics has decided that U.S.-China relationship, it's going to be a threat to a vital American interest. And so we're going to have a, a, a Kim Hell. We're going to divorce. But then on the surface, you cannot say it too loudly. So the Chinese were trying their best to keep a good relationship throughout the Trump eras. And then into the Biden, there was an opportunity. In, in Hawaii, they met uh, with Pompeo right? And didn't go too well. And then the Chinese went to American soil twice. That shows you how desperate the Chinese are to want to get the relationship better. I'm sure uh, Biden insisted that it has to be an American soil. So, okay, fine. The father's place, first one is Hawaii under Trump. Now it's Alaska uh, under Biden. So that, and, and as you know, you know, in dip diplomacy, you know, these kind of things matters where you meet and, and who speaks first and this and that. And the Chinese are bending backwards to go over the, uh, to go, uh, to go over the American soil twice. And the Chinese in particular, perhaps, is a little bit more, even more sensitive than most people on these kind of protocol issues. And yet what they got was a Blinken that is almost as bad as a Pompeo, as far as the Chinese are concerned. And that's why, you know, uh, they, they reacted, uh, Yang Yechi and, so, and Wang Yi. And so that really tells you that China wanted to uh, have a better relationship. Uh, and that was perhaps the last straw that broke the camel's back that Biden doesn't want it either. Uh, it's not gonna change. And so the Chinese begin to react. And that reaction, and you say China build up, military build up, the, all the build up, is a, it, it, it's a reaction to what the United States have been doing. Stop streaming down the middle of the, the Taiwan Strait. Stop spying in the, in the coastal regions and see if the Chinese will build up. If they had done that in the past, they probably would not have built up as much. 
And, and when you have a big country, which is the second largest economy in the world, you know, you know the movie Captain Phillips uh, uh, with uh, Tom Hanks? Uh, the, uh, that was American, uh, uh, you know, big ship that was uh, hijacked by the Somalian uh, pirates. Well, my question is, next time when the Chinese, uh, they need energy from the Middle East, as we all know. Next time is not Captain, uh, uh, Captain Phillips. Next time is Captain Henry Wong. Uh, then what happened? Uh, do they call the Seventh Fleet? The Seventh Fleet was the one that sent the, uh, the, 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 the aircraft carrier to Taiwan Strait in 1990s, uh, outside of Taiwan Strait in 1996. And then in subsequent years, for the last two and a half decades, uh, increasing military presence by the United States uh, uh, in, in the neighborhood. Of course, America has a good excuse. Hey, it, it's for our allies. Well, China has not done anything to any of Americans' allies in Asia for how long? Even Taiwan, which, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is part of China, just read history. Uh, even with Taiwan, China haven't, uh, Beijing has never had a problem since 1957 or 58 or something like that. And then America became very provocative. And then China has no choice but to react. So don't say the Chinese are, you know, military buildup is, is very dangerous. And the same thing with South China Sea, but I won't go into all that stuff. But anyway, uh, I think that, you know, we are already way beyond that point. I think the United States is like that lady friend of mine from decades ago who wanted the divorce. It's just, you cannot say it out loud yet for whatever reason, the children's education or whatever, this and that. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's really, really uh, bad news as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. But I think we are aware that the US-China relationship is certainly going through an agonizing <laughs> process. But we hope that uh, it will be really, uh, you know, getting better maybe in a, in a longer run. Because I, I recently, we had a, a CCG has conducted a number of uh, uh, dialogues. We, we talked to, uh, you know, uh, the Graham Allison, uh, Joseph Nye, uh, Martin Wolf, uh, Tom Friedman, you know, all of them. Uh, uh, and also two days ago, uh, uh, one day ago, we talked with John Fountain and, and quite a few others. Uh, well, I think they, all, they, all, they don't disagree uh, they, they, that we, we shouldn't have a great cold war. I mean, U.S. and China, uh, there was an adjustment period. I mean, Joseph and I, you said maybe by 2035, we, when we look back, we, we probably, uh, you know, can, can maybe uh, repair the, the, the relation and then maybe get back to uh, some kind of normalcy. We need a little bit longer uh, horizon to look at that. Uh, so, uh, so Susan, I know that you worked in the in the Council of Journal in Chengdu. It's unfortunate we shut that down. I mean, and then uh, U.S. shut down the Houston. I mean, I. Thank we got some me. positive news. Um, yeah, yeah, so maybe you could give some further advice on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I. I've heard quite a few people say that it's going to take quite a long time to, um, can you, you're still hearing me? I'm, okay. Um, okay. Take, take quite a long time for US-China relations to shake out this time, um, that we're going to go through a cycle of maybe, you know, 10 years of a downturn. But I really think that we cannot afford uh, to have that happen, because what's going to happen if uh, we have this divorce that Ronnie's talking about, or even a divorce uh, without the formality of divorce, but just basically a bifurcation or a separation? I mean, it's gonna it's gonna impact the international system, and we've got globalization now, so we need an international system, and it's uh, so I'm I'm not really convinced that we're going to be able to get along um, in, in the sort of globalized. I mean, we've passed peak globalization. I agree with Ronnie about that. But there are certain elements of globalization that are not going to turn back. And those still need to be uh, governed by some kind of international discourse and system that goes beyond just the UN charter. And I think, I mean, look at all these transnational uh, law enforcement cases. Um, I mean, these are extremely difficult for governments to work on together, particularly the U.S. and Chinese governments. They've always been difficult, but they're impossible right now. I mean, we're we just going to let these transnational criminals run rampant because the U.S. and China can't talk to each other. Um, and we need to have some kind of institutions that, you know, can generate consensus among countries and where we can sort of try to fit our systems together. And the thing I have to say about 
um, you know, China always standing on sovereignty and talking about how, you know, interference in internal affairs is prohibited by the UN Charter. I mean, this, you know, is a real problem in our relationship. And I think we have to have an honest conversation about it. I mean, all countries interfere in other countries' internal affairs. We have embassies in those, you know, countries, and they're always doing this kind of stuff, you know, monitoring what's going on there, lobbying the governments. I mean, that, you know, we're trying to influence each other constantly. And in a globalized world, you know, this is just going to be a fact of life. And so we've got to figure out what is the real problem here? What are the rules by which we can sort of regulate this? And how can we fit our systems together more seamlessly on both the economic front, because we absolutely need to do that, the first and second largest economies in the world, and we're not going to have trade, I don't believe it. So, um, you know, that's going to have to be worked out. But also all these other areas where we have overlapping and transnational boundary issues, migration, crime, um, cyber, space, all of these other areas, pandemics, health, um, transportation, uh, which, you know, mobility, uh, people movement back and forth. This isn't going to stop just because the U.S. and China aren't getting along. I mean, even during the Soviet Union, where we had a very major estrangement between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, we still had people flows and some trade back and forth. So, um, you know, and I, I want to just repeat again that China is not the Soviet Union and it should not try to be the Soviet Union. That would be a huge mistake for both China, but also for the for the world, I think. And, and certainly it wouldn't be good for U.S.-China relations. So um, I wonder, Ronnie, if you have a comment on that. Well, Susan, let me try to be a trumpet for a second. Uh, China is worse than uh, and the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was only a military threat. It wasn't an economic comp competitor. Whereas today, China is an economic competitor, but America want to turn it into a military threat as well. And so it is a very sad situation that uh, partly because of America's concoction, uh, China is today a comprehensive competitor or even enemy of the United States, uh, which is very sad. If you, if you want an enemy in the international community, you can have one very easily. And that's exactly what Trump has done. And in fact, that's what uh, Paul Wolfowitz and, uh, and Dick Cheney and all those guys uh, 30 years ago uh, already started. So, you know, I, you know, I, lo I told a CCG meeting uh, a couple of months ago that I lost $100 to uh, a bet to uh, Graham Allison. Uh, I'm trying to make it back from you, Susan. I'll, I'll be happy to bet you that in the next 10 years, your China relationship, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy a, a Graham Allison a good meal. But anyway, uh, and you buy me a good meal uh, if I win. Uh, I think next 10 years, I, I, I wish your China relationship can get on its own feet. I agree with you fully that the international system cannot afford to have the two uh, of the biggest economies uh, fight like that. And so, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, you talk about, uh, uh, you know, cyber and this and that. But what I really worry about, Susan, is the following, that the United States not being smart in, sorry, your diplomat, not being smart in diplomacy over the last 30, 40 years, it's going to force itself back to some form of isolationism. After all, America was founded in isolationism and not in nationalism. And, you know, for example, the, the, the role that America played uh, in the post-World War II era did the world a hell of a good. Uh, but on the other hand, <clears throat> once the Soviet fell, all the restraints is now gone. You know, America, you know, uh, uh, US uh, congressional research did a study that whereas before, roughly before uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, America had 1.1 uh, military action every year for the previous 170 years or whatever. And then after that is 6.1 times. Uh, per year. So I think that, you know, talking about interfering in other countries, uh, it is that uh, no country had the ability to interfere like the United States did. And when you're as powerful as the United States, you the way you interfere is a lot more. I mean, consider the fact that, you know, hey, some friend of mine uh, want to have a conference on, uh, in Japan, some Japanese, uh, to study whether America is a reliable uh, partner. I said, no, no need to have a, such a time, just call, call Merkel or, or, or Macron. And the phones were tapped, right? 
So, you know, talking about interfering in other people, uh, other countries, and when you have power and don't use it is really takes a lot of self enlightenment uh, to do that. And I think I worry that America has not been doing it for the last 30 years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union and afterwards even worse because there's no more restraint. Uh, and so, so America is forcing itself back into isolationism in some way. You cannot desegregate the world totally in economics and so forth. But as a leader of, uh, uh, of the world, uh, China was hoping for a long time that the United States will still be the leader of the world. China, as I have publicly stated many times, 10, 20 years ago, China is very happy to play second fiddle to the United States. But the United States feels threatened by the number two guy that he's gonna replace me as the concert master. So what can you do? Uh, and China is you know, economically rising. Uh, and then America is boxing China in uh, from uh, you know, Japan on the east, uh, India on the southwest, uh, and, and, and whoever in the west, uh, and, and so forth, uh, Vietnam in the south. And so, you know, when, if you are, uh, it, it put yourself in the Chinese uh, shoes and you feel boxed in by the number one uh, country in the world. And so you have to uh, survive. Uh, it, you know, uh, unless you say, okay, fine, I will, uh, uh, I'll be just like uh, small countries, very, very small countries, and bow to the United States. There's no way. China is 1.3 billion people, 1.4. And so I think the United States is f feeling very threatened, uh, which is unnecessary. And so one, I dis once I discovered the law losing of self-confidence on the part of the United States, what, 20 years ago, I said, this is really bad news. Uh, America should not lose self-confident and America should be able to work well with China. And I think chi on China's side, China can still work uh, to uh, be the second fiddle to the United States, but it's gonna be a lot tougher after the last couple of years of Trump and now, uh, now Biden. But I think it's still doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are we betting on? I didn't get what we're betting on. You say 10 years is not gonna be good and I say 10 years we will recover, is that it? Yeah. yeah. So I, so I have to find you and look you up in 10 years and you can take me to dinner or? <laughs> I think you will take me to dinner, Susan. <laughs> okay. I'll, 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 I'll bring good wine. I'll bring good wine. No, I, I think actually, you know, it's fascinating discussion, you know, uh, both Susan and Ronnie. And, and what, what I think, you know, both of you are really pointing down something very significant that, of course, uh, the, the, the post-Second World War, the U.S.-led uh, global governance system actually you know, push the world into prosperity. And, you know, we have avoided the major catastrophe of Third World War. Of course, we, we cannot, <laughs> now seems I like uh, working together on, on this pandemic war. But, uh, but, but absolutely, the, the system uh, probably needs upgrade, needs uh, enrichment, needs enhancement, uh, where I think China can probably, uh, you know, help uh, on that as well. Uh, I, I just read uh, some, uh, something that uh, Susan just probably mentioned before and wrote in that, uh, and you wrote that uh, the, uh, the only realistic path forward for the United States and China is to e co-evolve uh, through co cooperation and competition into adjusted and uh, sustainable order, which is, uh, which is well said. And also ch you said China active participation in international structure is now crucial to the development of the rest of the world. Its contribution will be key to making progress to the greatest challenges we face, which will continue to be transnational in nature. Uh, U.S.-China co-evolution in a globalized international system is the only realistic and productive path forward. So I think you said very well. Uh, now I, it seems now the, uh, the 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 you know we have a a, a lot of a slowdown on the global level, like WTO, like uh, you know uh, uh, other other international system. But then we have the regional, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually getting together now and then ASEP, uh, you know, China first it was. Uh, uh, ASEAN, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and then CPTPP, of course, uh, led by Japan uh, and uh, uh, Australia, but used to be designed by the US. Uh, so, so Susan, do you think that uh, on this global governance system, you know, how can we really uh, push forward? I mean, uh, like in a, in a more, uh, 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 like say globalization point two or, or globalization point three, that uh, whereas US, probably China also, that we can really, uh, work out uh, together with EU, with, uh, with other uh, uh, major economy. And uh, maybe, maybe G10 should have, a, uh, you know, have a, including China, Russian, 
India have a climate summit uh, or, 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 or pandemic summit, and G20 should play more role, and uh, and how the UN, you know, uh, can be more uh, uh, enhanced as well. And China is already the second largest donor to the UN, and then largest in the peacekeeping uh, force of the security members, uh, Security Council members. So, so what what do you think about that, and uh, how we can improve the global governance? I mean, in light of this new adjustment we we probably facing uh, right now, uh, Susan, please. Yeah, I. Um... So Henry, you've been present, I think, for some of the discussions we've had in this forum that um, was started on the back of the Global Solutions Summit around the G20, which is called, for lack of a better title, which is not a perfect title, but it's called the China West Dialogue. And it's really more about um, how to make sure that China is included in all of these global conversations. Because what I see and what I worry about is China kind of also sort of leaning out of the international system and starting a parallel track on its own where it's trying to sort of, it's frustrated in the international system. It's not able to get its voice heard. It's not participating as robustly as other countries and probably the Europeans are the most robust participators in the international system because they're the real rule drivers, I think, in the system more than the US or China actually. But, but, the, but we need China to be in the conversation and be participating actively and driving in this sort of consensus building way. And um, I think there's been a feeling, at least among people that, that uh, participate in those uh, meetings that that they don't have enough China, Chinese participation always, um, that China is a bit reticent still on the global stage to step up and contribute. Um, I've seen a big change over the last 20 years, certainly in this, in this space, but I think more is needed. I think the G20 is a very important uh, platform. Um, you know, it was created after, well, it was, it's been around for a while, but it really got going after the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And, um, you know, it is an, um, it's a big organization, you know, 20 countries is a lot, but it is a good flexible format where you can get, you know, different combinations of these countries, you can have guests, but it's not as huge as the UN with 190 something countries, um, which becomes a little bit unwieldy. So I think one question is sort of how to make these um, institutions that we have more action oriented and more specific and more productive. I mean, some of the um, annual meetings and fora that we have are more for sort of galvanizing conversation and generating consensus, but they move slowly. But we need uh, an organization that can move a little bit more quickly. And I think the G20 um, can be that if it has a little bit more structure and a little bit more uh, directionality and a little bit more support. It hasn't gotten a lot of support, I don't think, from all the countries involved all the time. And I hope it can become a more kind of leading organization. Of course, we've got the OECD on the economic front. We've got the World Bank and the IMF will continue to be important. Um, we've got various development organizations, um, the development banks, et cetera. So there are just a lot of uh, organizations at this point. And I think trying to get them to cohere, you really need the leadership driving it that comes from like a leaders meeting at the G20, something like that. Um, you know, I'm all for regional trade agreements, but frankly, you know, the global trading system is a global system and the WTO has to serve. And, you know, every country is in there that is a member of this global trading system and, um, you know, generating consensus there and reforms is difficult, but it, you know, that has system has got to work and, China's got to help us get that system to work, frankly. Um, and, you know, a big part of this is going to be how can we fit, you know, China's unique sort of economic model together with the economic models of others and what kind of changes can be made on both sides to make it fair and make uh, countries feel like they are able to compete and participate, you know, uh, on a level playing field in that in that arena. And I think we have a lot of work to do there. 
Yeah, thank you. I think WTO is really also important, and uh, we hope that we can get along that. I mean, Ronnie, uh, your, your, your comment on that? Well, I agree with Susan that you know G20 should be a very, very good um, uh, venue for a lot of issues on the, in the world. Uh, but China, as a new player to it, has to feel that uh, it is not uh, totally American-driven and dominated. Uh, and, and, and consider, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it must be under Obama during the G7 days, uh, which is really not representative enough. But anyway, uh, they invited Russia. You remember there was a year or two that okay. Russia was invited. And I thought to myself, what a joke. That's a joke. Sorry, Russia is a lovely country. The, the music and the literature is beautiful, but economically is not a player in the, in the global scene except in energy. And so, and you didn't invite China, you invited Russia. And, and it's obviously a, a message to the Chinese that you are out, we don't let you. Uh, and you know, it's not, communication is not what you say, it's what the other person hear. Moreover, I believe in this case, it was a deliberate message. And so uh, the, the Chinese have been watching this thing for the last 20, 30 years. Uh, as China economically rise, they see that you know, the West is increasingly uh, boxing it in. I don't like the, 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 the title uh, uh, China and the West, but anyway, it puts you in an the, in a adversarial p p position. And then you have pivot to Asia you know, under the Obama days. Who, who are you targeting? Oh, we're not targeting anybody. Come on. you know. Uh, uh, none of us are kids, okay? Uh, and, and so all these things uh, are really uh, forcing China to rethink uh, its position in the world. And China has been thinking about this, you know, G7, how long ago that was? That was a long time ago. Uh, pivot to Asia, that was Obama days. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, now Indo-Pacific, that's another subject. But anyway, uh, uh, understandably so from an American perspective, it is a really... Uh, part of the encirclement of China. Uh, so, so you know, if you are China, uh, you are living in a very un uncomfortable world. I don't think China will, will form a parallel international system. I don't think China is strong enough uh, or, or have the desire to do that. Ch Chinese don't speak English, by the way. And if you don't speak English well, you don't lead the world today. Uh, and China uh, will not do that. But if America is retreating from global leadership, then what will happen? It's, we, are, we are looking at a fragmented world that is it's going to be no leader. A lot of Americans assume that China will take the leadership uh, if America were to retreat. I don't think so. And if, by the way, if China is smart, it should not do that. It doesn't have the way with all to do it, very expensive. And so, you know, don't even attempt, just be a, a responsible player in the international uh, scene. But of course, uh, to be responsible is by whose rule. And so the Chinese say, it's all Western rule so far, which is, you can't change that. And China was uh, happy to accept it as long as you don't box China in as uh, the West, in particular, the United States has been uh, together with, you know, a few small countries, you know, like Australia and, and Japan and or, 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 uh, India is not that small uh, in population. But anyway, so, so you know, the, the world is in a very, very bad situation. Uh, and I, I believe that it really began when America lost self-confidence and be, decided that China is a threat uh, to its own vital interests. I say again. China is not a threat, in my opinion, to American vital interests. It's, a, <clears throat> uh, it's a, a threat to American leadership, sole leadership, perhaps. Uh, and, and, and China is very happy to work with America as a co-equal uh, protocol-wise. But privately, yeah, you know, second fiddle, I think China was happy to play. And I hope that China will be uh, able to be convinced uh, to still work with the United States um, when the other side really don't want to work with you. Yeah, though no, I, I think that China has actually, the governor said many times that China doesn't want to replace the US. China wants to be <laughs> really uh, working with the US on, on those international uh, uh, governance issues because uh, there's no intention from China to replace the US or the US shouldn't worry about that. So, 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 so maybe, maybe uh, you know, uh, uh, one final question from me is that uh, uh, what we can we work together uh, because uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we had John Kerry come to Shanghai uh, uh, in March, and uh, and also President Xi attended the President Biden's Earth Day summit on climate change. 
uh, so, so that is actually a, a, a good sign that, uh, you know, we have many things to work on. I mean, just now, uh, Susan mentioned the issues like North Korea, uh, Iran, Myanmar, and now even Afghanistan now <laughs> become a vacuum. So many issues uh, we, we could, uh, pandemic is probably the most urgent one as well. Uh, but they actually, uh, just uh, at our conference, uh, 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 the seventh annual uh, CCG annual conference, we had a former Vice Minister Chen Jian of Commerce actually said, you know, at the conference that maybe we could work with to get U.S. on the on the on those infrastructure project. I noticed that uh, Biden has already reached a consensus with uh, probably uh, both bipartisan on investing U.S. sugar infrastructure because I think U.S. The, uh, and not only US, but also the rest of the world all need infrastructure. The infrastructure could be the next biggest impetus and the drive for the global economy and global globalization as well. So, so, so in, that, in that area, can we work together like Vice Minister Chen said, you know, uh, maybe the, the B3W or Blue Dot and uh, of the US proposed G7 purpose, China can you know, work with that with BI or, or, or EU's uh, Euro Asia connectivity portal. So if we all think about global uh, uh, infrastructure and maybe we have something big to, 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 to work on uh, in the future to, to glue every country uh, onto the new global uh, system, even we can upgrade uh, AIB to GIB probably with US participation, uh, a global infrastructure investment bank. And uh, well, I think that that is something we need to really work into the common objective. So, so on, on the things that we can work together, maybe here, Susan, uh, uh, what's your take uh, uh, in, the, in this respect? Yeah, I really hope so. I mean, I think that would be, um, you know, a very, a very logical place for us to pool our efforts. And in fact, you know, we've had these kinds of joint projects in the past. Um, I remember smart cities was an area where the U.S. and China worked very closely together and we had local uh, officials from states and provinces in China together trying to learn from each other about how to use technology to better manage and serve populations in cities. And I think that could be uh, continue to be very important. Energy, technology, cooperation and deployment has been a huge uh, area of joint cooperation between the US and China in the past. Um, you know, we've unfortunately come to this again, this kind of competition over infrastructure and who's going to get influence in another country by building a project. I don't think that it should be that kind of a competition. I know under the Obama administration, there was an effort to sort of uh, work, uh, you know, in Africa together. China had a lot of projects in Africa and we were doing a lot of power projects in Africa. We we're trying to figure out how to make them work together. I mean, I do think it is hard for us to work together because we have a different way of doing things, you know, um, in certainly in infrastructure projects, um, you know, there are cultural and other, you know, just sort of commercial differences. But I think, you know, these are areas that are in sort of it. It's not as clear cut a case as a pandemic, which is a public health emergency, but it's pretty, it should be pretty easy and apolitical to work on sort of development projects in third countries, in my opinion. Um, if you can figure out how the comparative advantages line up, then you can do it. But we need the political will, which isn't there right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the U.S. has been running World Bank for many years now. China has AIB. I mean, all those development banks uh, probably can work together. Actually, uh, John Fountain just said, uh, you know, webinar that uh, at one time, actually, China and U.S. were talking about collaborating on BI. And John Kerry told, told me at the Munich Security Conference last year as, same thing. So, so there's there's a possibility. You know, if we can work on climate, and also the you know China already quite advanced on that uh, in terms of clean uh, vehicles and uh, and the solar energy and the wind power and things like that. We could work with US on on infrastructure. I mean, US has a lot of uh, advantage, and I think we can work on other countries. Whereas President Xi just had the uh, video conference with uh, President Macron and uh, Angela Merkel talking about working in Africa. We should get U.S. working on that together. So, so we have something common to work together. Then, rather than we dividing us, maybe uh, now, one, you, yeah. one of the things I worry about is that the focus on COVID nineteen is now taking the you know it's taking up a lot of oxygen that should be being devoted to climate change, and that could be the next tragedy of the commons that we all face. We can't 
it's very hard to do two things, two big things like that at once. So I, I you know, I, this is why I say co-evolution is the only way and with the pandemic even more so now. Absolutely, I, I agree. I think that we, we need to have this uh, plan in the future. We have something at least to, to hope for that uh, we're, we're not thinking about Hijiji's trap uh, uh, all the time. So right. we can really think about those good things that we can work together. Uh, absolutely, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, those are really uh, climate change and uh, infrastructure and particularly pandemic fighting is the most urgent thing we need to work together. Uh, Ronnie, you, you, your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think that uh, to work, anything that uh, is too uh, involved in politics, will, international policy will be very different, difficult. I think pandemic is really where we should all begin. Uh, and then the environment, the climate, uh, as, by the way, Susan, climate is the number two in my list of eight terrible things that can happen to mankind. Uh, and I think that, you know, in these issues, uh, you know, if please convince uh, the White House uh, and the State Department not to be uh, too politi politically driven uh, and just solve issues, problem, practical problems, I think uh, the world will be a much better place. There are many other issues out there like uh, international you know, standards and, and all, all that stuff. You know, it's really a lot of problem that only the two biggest countries work together uh, can be solved. And uh, <clears throat> um, but given today's political environment, uh, I'm really, really saddened by the situation. Uh, but I hope that with uh, uh, John Kerry's effort, you know, on the climate, uh, because let's face it, the Democrats are far more willing uh, to, 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 to work on this subject than, the, than the, and the Republicans. But that said, I think America overall is behind. It just I couldn't believe how many Americans uh, do not believe uh, in climate change, uh, climate change. Uh, and so somehow uh, uh, America in this regard has to uh, step up uh, as well. China knows that their fast development of the last 30 years is really damaging their own environment terribly. And of course, that would damage other people's environment as well, because we all share the same global village. And so the Chinese are really, really serious about dealing with the environment. So I think that's one area that if the United States show a, a stronger interest, the two parties may be able to work together and we need to, and also, uh, you know, America is now uh, ganging up uh, with uh, bringing friends to encircle China. Uh, you, you don't let those kind of things, those things, frankly, in my opinion, is not useful. I mean, how, how much can Australia help or, or, or even, uh, you know, India or, or, or Japan? Uh, but, you know, uh, optically, it's really, really very damaging uh, to the Beijing leaders. Uh, and, and if you don't let those things go, uh, I think that co uh, cooperation will be limited. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, we, we had a, a very, very uh, good, good discussion act <laughs> so far. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that the U.S. and China should really work in, but one of the urgent things about pandemic is about this virus uh, vaccine recognition, because uh, we had people cannot travel because of different countries, different countries didn't recognize uh, uh, vaccine China produced or, or, or U.S. pharmaceutical company produced. Uh, you know, the mobility of the, of the issue of the, uh, if we're going to coexist with virus for a long time to come, how we can really uh, you know, start this reboot, world, you know, the international travel, but at the same time, uh, maintain the, maintain the contain the virus. That's really a big issue. I mean, for many countries, students cannot come, even like a Swartzman College for the whole year, <laughs> the student can come to China, uh, not, not studying, you know, graduated already, not, not attending one day at the campus. So, so and also uh, a Chinese student can't go to the United States and things like that. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of issues that we can, work on the international uh, travel, but, but probably recognize the vaccine of those countries that uh, are recognized by WHO. And uh, so th those are really great. Uh, actually, my staff was telling me we had about, uh, you know, for almost 400,000 people bringing us online. And uh, we, 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 we almost come to the con conclusion of our, our, our webinar, but we have received a, a few uh, questions from online uh, media as well. So I just passed those questions and we have a final round and maybe uh, also have some concluding remarks as well. Uh, I, have a, I have a question from uh, uh, China Daily, uh, which uh, asks that uh, the US administration made the rounds of a pushing lab leaking hypothesis uh, while turning uh, deaf to the, well, not to really 
responding to the four Detroit probe requests. Uh, so what, what's your view on that? There was another uh, news uh, from Guangxi uh, News, uh, which is based in Shanghai. The United States used its economic and financial power to dominate the global economic order and used the sanctions against many countries uh, and enterprises. At present, the United States still imposing sanctions on some officials in Iran, Huawei, and even Hong Kong, China. Uh, many enterprises have to comply with the U.S. decrees of cutting off exchanges with relevant entities. However, since last year, China taken a series of countermeasures and formulated laws and regulations, such as anti-foreign sanction law of, of the People's Republic of China, measures for blocking improper extraterritorial application of foreign laws and measures, provision on a list of uh, unreliable entities. So today, there may be direct conflicts between the laws and regulations of China and those of the United States in some field, and it seems to be very difficult to abide by the laws of both sides at the same time. What should enterprises do? Can WTO and other multilateral mechanisms play a role in such situation? There's another question from Beijing News. The eve of Chinese Lunar New Year, President Xi Jinping had a full conversation with the US President Biden. Then the US China held high levels in Alaska and recently in Tianjin. Uh, so, so we probably cover some of that. How would you comment on the exchanges between China and the United States and your, your, your prediction for the future? Uh, what are the prospects for cooperation between China and the United States? So I think we have the, you know, those are questions posed online, but we, we love to hear your back, uh, feedback, but also uh, your, your final uh, conclusion and remarks uh, for our webinar, which uh, uh, this is our second uh, special feature webinar of the seventh uh, Center for China and Globalization Forum. Uh, well, I can, I'll, I'll just start and be real quick because I think we did address some of those issues during our earlier rounds, but on the issue of the pandemic, I mean, I think that I've been pretty clear and pretty strong in my clarion call for better cooperation between the US and China to face the ongoing pandemic and mitigate the damage in our own countries, but also to help other governments really uh, face up to the problems that they have and get vaccines out throughout the world. I mean, nobody's going to be safe in either one of our countries until not just our people get vaccinated, but everybody gets vaccinated. And we can't keep our country shut down. As Henry, you were just saying, we have to restore mobility. So in order to do that, we've got to get everyone vaccinated. And we'll probably need booster shots every year. So there's going to be a lot of vaccine production and we should be focused on cooperating how to get that done. Um, on the question about what should enterprises do, I mean, this gets to the issue of how we need rules in the international system to govern this commercial space that has come about under globalization and is a fantastic thing for promoting global prosperity. We need to repair the WTO. We need to get together and agree on rules of how our systems are gonna to fit together, which countries' courts um, should be able to decide disputes or how dispute resolution is gonna work in all these cases. We can't keep having these anti-suit injunctions and then you have an anti-anti-suit injunction and competing court processes. I mean, this is not the way we should be moving. Um, and I think it is really difficult for companies right now. Um, it's gonna continue to be difficult until we can get some repair work done on this relationship. On um, the last thing on the exchanges at the official level between the US and China, we've talked a little bit about that. What I wanna say is that, you know, the relations between our governments are not always going to be very good. And in recent years, of course, they've not been good at all. But it doesn't mean that the relationship on the non-governmental level has to be hostage to that official relationship. There's a lot that goes on day to day between the United States and China in business, in culture, in ac academics and education, in, um, you know, exchanges and all kinds of other areas that need to uh, continue, that need to be expanded. And I really hope, Henry, that your Globalization Center can have some kind of a youth summit so we can get younger voices in on this conversation, because those are the people that are going to be affected by this relationship that Ronnie predicts is going to be bad for the next 10 years. 
I mean, this is the lives of young people in both our countries. It's a significant portion of the global population and they should be in on the conversation um, to try to, you know, understand what's happening and, and so that we can hear their voices on how they think about it too. Thank I'm you, with Susan. you, uh, Susan, that we have to have a rule-based society. But when you have one country who is so big that it can write its own laws, such as I sanction you, uh, uh, is that rule-based? I don't know. Uh, and, and, and then I, I really worry about this thing, about the, the, the sanctioning of businesses and this and that, and the counter uh, sanctioning, uh, as you rightly pointed out. And so, you know, yeah, let's have a rule-based society, the only way to go, but not when a, one country is so big that it can totally, frankly, uh, re reject the, the, the rules and yet still give the perception that I am the rule, I am righteousness. Uh, you guys break the law, I don't, but the reality is check history. America pro probably broke uh, more law or international rules than any other country. So I think that it comes back to a, a, a very fundamental point I'll end there. And that is the world for the last 200 years has seen Asian waning and it has seen the West rising. So the, and, and then after World War II, the United States become the undis in, undisputed leader of the world. And it's done a lot of good, as I, I, I've said. But on the other hand, although it has done a lot of good, if one is not self-enlightened and to not keep uh, and keep our own superiority complex, that a big country like China cannot economically rise. And if it rises, it would disrupt the international system. Well, that's it's that your interest in the international system, that you led the world to form for good in the past, but the world has changed. You cannot deny the fact that 1.4 billion people has gone you know, from a 1,000 per capita, US dollar per capita income to now a 10,000. Uh, and, and, and so the world has changed. And so the West has to gradually adjust to a world which is a fairer world, a world where there are other people, sorry to bring this word in, who is of the different race uh, that is rising. And Japan rising was a, a shock to America 40, 50 years ago, but they were small. There was only 120 million people or less than that in those days. But China is big, is, is 10 times bigger in size and more. And so I think the West to adjust uh, intellectually, culturally, mentally, to a, a different world. If not, uh, then I do worry that I think 10 years are a little bit too short to expect any positive change, Susan. But uh, in line with what you said about having a non-government, since now you're out of government and I'm never in government, I will still buy your dinner uh, and bring the wine. Uh, and then you bring your friend from Yale and I bring my friend from wherever, uh, from Hong Kong, okay. and we will have a nice discussion together. It's a deal. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, we had a very uh, fruitful and uh, stimulating and, uh, and productive discussion and dialogue this morning and, and also this evening. Uh, and that's exactly what CCG would like to do is to promote uh, the dialogues and understanding and also uh, to really explain the points on, on both sides. And I think this is really uh, also the meaning of our, of our annual conference as well. We had so many uh, lively discussions on, on that as well. So, so I really uh, appreciate that. We also have a large aud online audience uh, participate this morning uh, and also some media. But I think that the point is really uh, well taken that we, I think China and the US, you know, in the, in the 21st century, situation has been changed. You know, the, the uh, diameter has been changed that we have to work together. I mean, for the sake of the whole humanity. And, and also we have the moral responsibility. I think the US being the largest economy, China being the second largest, we have the moral responsibility to the 7.5 billion people, not just between China and US. And I think in that respect, I, I, I think that, you know, we need really uh, intensive our communication, our dialogue and high level visit, student exchanges, tourism, <laughs> and uh, scenes, believing, and also culture and media and, uh, and, and, and resume our, our consulate and things like that. So I, I really think uh, those are the good things we, we, we all uh, talked about. And uh, I, I really appreciate uh, both of your time and uh, particularly uh, uh, Susan, you join us uh, late in the evening now and uh, really <laughs> very thankful. And also, uh, uh, you know, we're going to continue our webinar 
Uh, tomorrow we're going to have uh, another webinar with uh, Pascal Ami, the, the former uh, WTO Director General, also uh, Randy Cutler, the acting uh, USTR uh, in, the, in the Obama administration. So uh, I want to thank both of you very much. Uh, uh, Susan uh, Sontem, the uh, senior fellow at the uh, Yale uh, uh, Center uh, at, uh, of the Paul Chai Center at Yale University, and also Ronnie Chen. Uh, he's uh, uh, the chair of uh, uh, Hong Kong property in Hong Kong, but also uh, 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 a position of many uh, uh, important organizations. So once again, thank you and thank our audience. Uh, thank you, all the viewers, and uh, appreciate all your participation. Thank you very much. We hope to see you thank again. Thank you. Thank you.